Well, hey, everybody. What's up? Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into this YouTube channel. Today, we're going to do a little screen share, and we're going to go in deep on uh, some concepts that I use for sermon manuscript production. Now, I realize that not everybody out there is a preacher. Uh, some of you are, though. In fact, when I did a survey of all of my viewers and listeners, quite a few of you are in ministry of some sort, either senior pastors or youth pastors or associate pastors, Bible teachers, whatever. And so there's a possibility, maybe an outside shot, that something I might say about the way that I do sermons may click with you. And so you may end up learning something. Who knows? Otherwise, uh, maybe this isn't your video. Feel free to check out if you're not interested in how to, how to make or write a sermon. But for those of you who are, very glad you're here. Again, my name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Reformed church just north of Pittsburgh. And if you're anywhere in the area, we'd love to have you come worship with us at 8.30, 11, or 4 o'clock p.m. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you some behind-the-scenes stuff. In fact, I'm recording a Zoom call here. That's the technology I'm using today. And I'm going to just do a screen share, and I'm going to take you through some of the elements um, from my end on sermon production. So a little bit of a behind-the-pulpit kind of an inside view of what I do. Now, I should make a disclaimer here that what I do is not the only way. There are many different people, many different preachers, many different faithful ways to do a sermon or manuscript production. This is just one way. Hopefully, it's a faithful way. Uh, but if you do something different, that's totally fine. But this is for the person who's maybe curious about uh, what's actually happening during the uh, during the sermon itself and the writing that leads up to it, et cetera. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, hopefully, now you can see what we have on the screen. We're recording. Let me go ahead and big up this little uh, picture of myself. Hello, I'm in the corner now. Uh, so here's a, a typical sermon manuscript that I've written. This is actually last week's sermon. Up here on the top, Beware False Teachers, Isaiah 30, 8 to 17 is the text. And typically what I do here is I write about three pages of manuscript material. Now for me, I'm the kind of person that likes to write out everything that I'm going to say. I'm not very creative on the spot. In fact, if you know me in real life, I'm actually pretty flat footed when it comes to answering questions that are sort of spontaneous. I dread congregational meetings because I'm afraid somebody's going to ask me a question about the budget or something that I don't know. I'm just not very good of a impromptu spontaneous thinker. And so most of my writing, most of my pre-preaching production happens right here, where you're normally joining me right here in the study at Gospel Fellowship Presbyterian Church. Some people say that that's not leaving room for the Spirit of God to work. I disagree with that. I think um, the study is a perfectly appropriate place <laughs> for the minister to encounter God's Word and to have Holy Spirit you know, illumination as he's working through the text. And so I don't think there's anything super spiritual about a person who gets up with no notes and no plan and just sort of spontaneously begins saying things. I don't think that's any more spiritual than what I do, which is to prepare and to over prepare to go into the pulpit. So what you're looking at here is about three pages of notes. Now, some people have asked me, how much do you write? The answer to that is about 2,500 words on some longer sermons, maybe 3,000 words, but I usually squeeze it, squeeze it down onto three pages of, of manuscript. And um, when I print it up, I'm going to show you, this is a, a PDF copy of my actual notes. Once I printed it, you can see I've got highlighting here. I take some notes and pens. As I go through the manuscript multiple times in preparation for taking this into the pulpit with me, um, I use different colors of ink. Um, I do other things to remind myself of what's important here, some drawing, some connections and things like that. But basically, by the time I'm ready to go into the pulpit, I should have not only written out my entire sermon, but I've also gone over it a couple of times in my head, even making various markings throughout. So going back here to my Word document, this is going to be my opening. Now, I typically will open with something that's an attention drawing device. Usually it's only a couple of minutes of content, uh, two to three minutes is enough, but some kind of a story, some kind of uh, an anecdote, maybe a humorous element. Basically what you're doing there is you're winning the affection of the hearer, perhaps people who haven't heard you preach before, and you're letting them know you're a real person. <laughs> uh, hopefully you're engaging with eye contact, all that kind of thing. 
And in the second paragraph, what I'm going to do then is transition to the text because I'm not a storyteller. I'm not a joke teller. Uh, I'm not a motivational speaker or an entertainer of any kind. And so after I've given my opening bit here, then I'm going to quickly transition as much as possible to this third paragraph, which is the historical context of the passage that I'm exegeting or expositing. If you're not giving context, then are you really doing exposition? My answer to that is probably not, because every single passage of scripture is related to the tangential material, material on either side of that passage. And especially as you're working through books of the Bible, you want to make sure that you are constantly, um, constantly explaining what the big picture scenario is. We want to make we want to avoid two mistakes. The one is to lose the forest for the trees, and the other is to lose the trees for the sake of the forest. And so a good sermon should remind the listener where we are in the context of exposition. Um, but but we don't want to miss the details in the text either. And so that's what we're going to be doing for most of the sermon is just expositing the details with application to the hearer. Now, let me say one more thing about manuscripting. You see right here, uh, this opening bit is, is, um, is a piece that I wanted to write out pretty well as far as the manuscript. I don't write for publication when I'm making a manuscript. I'm writing for myself. And so a lot of my ser sentences aren't going to be complete. A lot of times it's going to be short, punctiliar thoughts. But in this case, I actually wanted to write out this paragraph fairly well because I wanted to also place it over here in my, dis my digital miscellaneous system. Now, my digital miscellaneous system is basically a note keeping device in which I keep uh, sermon illustrations and anecdotes, um, historical things, great quotes, and I keep them in an alphabetical listing that I call this right here, my digital miscellaneous. And you can see I've got them tabbed so I can uh, jump to different places in the alphabet. But basically this I thought was a pretty good opening illustration about false teachers. And so I wanted to copy and paste that and put it into my digital miscellaneous for later use. I might use this one again. In fact, I know I'm going to use it in a new book that I'm working on. I have a new book that I'm currently in development with. The working title is Zero. Um, uh, what is the subtitle? The subtitles, um, apart from Christ, you can do nothing. That's right. That's the idea of, of the gospel, a clear and concise exposition of the gospel. It's at uh, about 157 pages or so right now, but I, but I knew I wanted to use this opening illustration, so I made sure to write this out really well when I was working on my manuscript. And I think that's another benefit of actually doing manuscripts is that you can use these things later. Uh, cut, cut and paste it, store it for later in my digital miscellanies, and then uh, who knows, at some point, maybe even plug it into a book draft that I'm going to work on. Now, back to, uh, to manuscripting here. After I do my historical context, where I'm outlining what's happening in terms of the literary flow of the book or historical background to the book, then I usually come to this all bold statement right here. And this is one of the most important things I do in manuscripting is tell the audience what my outline is for this particular sermon. Now, in this example right here, I'm challenging my audience to become savvy hearers, hearers of the gospel, and we're going to specifically be looking for five signs of false teachers or false prophets in this text from Isaiah chapter 30, all right? At this point, I'm going to go into my, what I would call my main points. Now, in this sermon here, there's actually five main points. I think that's too much. And typically, I've talked about this before in a video called How Many Points Should a Sermon Have? Usually, there's one point, two point, and three point sermons. And I refer you to that video for a better breakdown of what I mean by a one point sermon. A two point sermon should have tension where the two points are kind of in opposition to one another not contradictory, but uh, for instance, to live as Christ, to die as gain, something like that would be a good two-point sermon. Three-point sermons tend to work out fairly well. This one is five. And so in this case, I'm actually going to have to hurry myself through the material a little bit to get in five full points of preaching. But then again, I'm not stressed because I know that 2,500 25, 25 words 
written out um, is going to be about 40 to 42 minutes of preaching material. And I don't make things up on the fly. I don't make things up on the spots. I tend not to have big aha, uh, you know, light bulbs pop in my head as I'm preaching. So for the most part, I try to stick with my, my sermon itself. Now, I am not a manuscript reader, however. I think manuscript reading is the most boring kind of uh, preaching that there is. And some people can do it well, uh, other people not so much. And so my goal when I'm preaching is to be able to make great eye contact with my folks and to deliver the message in a fairly fluid manner. Now, the audio may not be so, uh, so terribly good here because I'm just recording a Zoom call, but let's take a moment just to check out the opening of the sermon illustration. I want you to notice how I'm not, not dependent on my manuscript as I'm preaching. When the famous preacher came to town, thousands of people gathered together to see him live and in person. They'd seen him on the television screen for years. They'd seen his face on all of his books in Walmart. And so the city was alive and buzzing when this famous, famous television preacher uh, came to town. In fact, the local news even covered it like a rock star had come debuting some sort of a new album. And people gathered together downtown. They filled the streets. They lined up in the arena to see what he would have to say that night. Everybody was excited when the famous preacher came to town, except for one man. And that'll be enough of that. If you want more of that sermon, you can go actually check out that sermon either on our YouTube channel, Gospel Fellowship PCA, or you can go listen to it on the podcast. Uh, my point here is not so much to feature that sermon, though, as to illustrate the point that the better you do manuscripting, the less you have to depend on the manuscript itself. Uh, some of you are very heavily manuscript dependent, and probably what that means is you're not engaging your mental visual memory as you're delivering the message. And I've talked about that before in other videos as well, so I don't necessarily want to recover all that ground here. I would simply say that your, your memory is probably better than you give yourself credit for. Uh, you probably think that you can't memorize an entire sermon manuscript, and you don't actually have to memorize the entire manuscript. The manuscript is there as a guidepost for you as you're, as you're simply a delivering the message naturally and freely to remind you of what the order of your main points is. But you should not be reading your manuscript to the congregation lest you, lest you bore them to death. And again, I'll refer you to other, other videos on a topic. Let's go back to the manuscript itself. So a couple of things that I do here, which are visual cues. One of them is I always highlight the main points in a color as I'm printing out my manuscript. This is gonna easily catch my eye. So when I'm preaching, if I forget what my next main point is, um, I can easily just jump to the color and that's going to be where my points are. So number one about false preachers is they follow the market. Number two, they, pre they preach smooth content that doesn't have any abrasive uh, confrontation to it. It departs from the way, it's godless, and it despises the word. So as I'm preaching through my manuscript, of course, it's really easy to find my main points because those are the ones that are in color. Now, another thing that I do that I think is important is I tend to bold and underline the scriptures themselves. I'm in a Bible expositor. And so one of my main goals in preaching of any sermon is to get my people to look down at the text. Look at your Bible. Have your Bibles open. Have your Bibles on the lap. Sometimes I'll say things like, if you're a Bible writer, underline, circle, or mark this verse or this word or this piece of imagery, because I want people following not so much me, I want them following the text. And so every single main point that I have is going to be in some way a restatement or an exposition of what the text itself actually says. And so main points are going to be highlighted in bold, uh, colored, and underlined. And then notice this too here throughout the paragraph, I'm drawing them back again to the actual language of scripture over and over again, the things that are said in scripture, quoting uh, from various passages, and I remind myself to do that by underlining those points. Okay, uh, sometimes when, I, uh, when I'm preaching through my manuscript, let's go back to the actual manuscript, I like to draw pictures to myself. I like to draw little arrows. You can see here five is the big reminder of five points. 
Um, this right here, big exclamation point, that's to remind me to really, really preach that point. I really want to hammer this one home. I want to convey some sort of intensity here as I'm preaching that particular point. And uh, sometimes I'll even draw little pictures right here in the text. Here's some blood and here's some tears. I follow the blood of the master, the tears of the master. That was one of my points about staying on, on the way. And so that's, that's another thing that I do too. Notice that um, I try to fill up the space on the manuscript as much as possible. And so to do that, I'm going to truncate sentences like I've done here. I'm going to make very abbreviated sentences like I've done here. So I want to jam this manuscript with as much possible information as I can, because what I really want to do is I want to avoid having several pages of manuscript. If I have five or seven or 10 pages of manuscript, I'm going to be constantly flipping through them in my notebook. I do find that distracting if I'm in the audience. How many times is the preacher turning this page in his notebook? That way, I, I feel three pages is right. That's only one turn for me. So I have pages one and two sprawled out in front of me on the pulpit. Uh, going back to pulpit view right here, I've got this big wide pulpit. So back right here, I've got pages one and two. I've got my Bible in my hand. And only one time do I actually need to turn the page. So that's not overwhelmingly distracting to the audience. Now, sometimes I'll do something like this right here in the midst of a paragraph. I have three sub points, even in the very point that I'm trying to make. So this is actually big point number two in terms of the flow of the text or the sermon. But notice I, I broke this down into three sub points. Now, typically for me, that's just a mnemonic device. For me to remember that paragraph. It helps me to sometimes remember a whole paragraph so I don't have to look down at it at all uh, just by memorizing sub points within, within the main. All right. Um, now, every once in a while, you're going to have to look at your manuscript and don't be ashamed to do that. People expect that. That's why you've got the pulpit in front of you. It's really not that big of a deal to actually look down at your manuscript. At some point, in fact, Maybe we might even be able to pick a random, here's a random spot right here. Look, I'm looking at my manuscript. So what? I'm still delivering it with a very natural flow. That's not a big deal. I'm not overly concerned because in some really technical manuscript writing, yeah, um, there's going to be things that you can't, you just can't memorize everything. One of the things that I had to look down on in this particular sermon was my heresies that I wanted to mention. And so I knew that I was going to talk about heresies in this particular moment. <laughs> but, you know, little baby cries in the back or somebody gets up or, you know, somebody drops a hymnal and you get distracted. That's OK. I forgot my heresies that I was going to mention. And so I quickly looked down at my outline and there they are. Docetism, Gnosticism, Arianism, Pelagianism and humanism. And so what? I read it right off of the manuscript. Here's another place right here. I have a phrase from Hebrew, Kadosh Israel. I might typically go ahead and just read that so I don't mispronounce it and make a fool out of myself. And uh, here's a place in my manuscript where I completely did a abbreviated bullet point outline. And that's okay, too. Um, I knew that I had a little bit more to say about these metaphors that Isaiah makes in chapter 30, 13, and 30, 14. And this is a little bit of flex time for me as I'm preaching the sermon because I'm, I'm not always sure how the time is going to go. Now, I know in my brain as I'm preaching that, yeah, I typically want to end around noon uh, for the later service. I want to end around 5 p.m. for the afternoon service. But um, sometimes you move through your material faster than you were expecting. And quite honestly, sometimes you move through your material slower than you were expecting. So a lot of times what I'll do towards the end of a sermon is I'll build in a little bit of flex time for myself so I can keep myself regu regulated in terms of my pace. And in this case, I knew if I got to all of my five main points, I would already feel pretty content that I had preached a good expository sermon. Every main point, again, being drawn from the word of God itself, even the sub points being drawn from the word of God itself, which is another hallmark of true exposition. And here I had a couple of sub points that were illustrations from Isaiah. Uh, he says heresy is like a broken down wall or like a vessel that is smashed that is no good or no use to the people. And so I bullet pointed these so that I could freestyle them in the pulpit if I if I needed to do so. 
towards the end then I have uh, a point of application. Notice there's only one brief point of application in the sermon, but that's only because I knew that many of the main points were already stocked, filled with plenty of application already. And by the way, of course, a good sermon has application. Um, even in places of the scripture where the application is not necessarily apparent, that's part of the difference between teaching and preaching. Uh, both are good, both are commended in scripture, of course, but teaching is the conveyance of information, whereas preaching um, is actually the conviction of the heart. And so it's the difference between a third person lecture on Abraham and a second person uh, challenge to trust, believe, and repent to the congregation that you're speaking to. So make sure, brothers who are preachers, that your sermons are filled with plenty plenty of application, and you will be doing a, a good job as a Bible preacher. Now, whether or not you use manuscripts or whether or not you use outlines or you come into the pulpit with a sticky note, as one preacher that I one time knew used to do, one of the most important things I can say about preaching is simply to be yourself. Please, whatever you try to do, don't be Matthew Everhard. Um, <laughs> I'm not even worth emulating. But don't try to be John Piper either. He is worth emulating, but you're never going to be John Piper, and you're not going to be Edwards, and you're not going to be Calvin. You're the only you, and your people are the only congregation that's them. And so you have the freedom, of course, in Christ, by the power of the Spirit, with the authority of this good, inspired book, to be yourself in the pulpit. That's the most important thing I could possibly say. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for checking into this brief video. Very glad to, to have you with me today. Do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.